I cannot begin to put into words the honor that it is for me to stand here with you tonight to celebrate the lives that we will lift up this evening. It is an honor to be in your midst. I grew up among you, and it is good to be back. Uh, you all look, look great. Um, <laughs> it is good to see familiar faces again. The honor of being with you tonight was enhanced just in the last hour or two by the opportunity to spend some time with the families of those that we honor this evening. I sat at a table with uh, the Woodring family, and uh, Rachel Woodring, Mark Woodring's daughter, uh, we talked PK stuff. And uh, she said, one of the things that she used to do was sit in the sanctuary and pretend to fall asleep as her, where her dad could see her, so that she, in hopes that he would wrap it up soon. <laughs> and I thought, oh, why didn't I ever think of that? What a great idea. So I'm going to keep an eye on Rachel from up here. So if, if she starts nodding off, I'll know to, to wrap it up. Oh, there she is. Okay, I'll keep an eye on her. In a few minutes, uh, I'm going to ask you to do something. And uh, I know just by being among you the last uh, day or two that you are a vocal group. And for that, I give thanks. I would like for you, if you would, um, in the next few minutes, to be in thought about those names that are listed before you, those names that we are honoring tonight. And no doubt there are one or two names on that list that you know maybe quite well. I'd invite you to think of a word that would help describe that person for you. Perhaps it is a characteristic that they had. A little later on, I'm going to ask you, if you would, from where you are, just to share the first and last name in that one word that you want to lift up, that characteristic. And it's not so much so that everyone can hear you, but more to lift it up in this wonderful cacophony of noise that I hope we have uh, among us as we pour out the lives that we remember. So I just want you to keep in mind that to keep that in mind as as we progress tonight. It was a warm June evening, perhaps not quite as warm as it is tonight, almost 17 years ago. I was living in a barn at the time. Well, it wasn't really a barn, it was a converted milk house, but I like to say I lived in a barn for the summer. I was the state park chaplain at World's End and Ricketts Glen State Parks. Woo and in those days, I stayed up past 10 o'clock. <laughs> and it was about midnight, and the moon was at its absolute fullest. And one of the benefits of living in this particular milk house was that it was right next to the Loyal Sock Creek. And I took a walk down one evening when that moon was full, and I sat by the side of the creek, and in fact walked uh, part way across because the water was low and the rocks were out and the moon was so bright. The noise and the, the sound of the water rushing past me sounded exactly like the sound of someone laughing. And in my mind, it was God laughing. And you know how it is when you hear somebody laughing, even if you don't know what they're laughing at, you can't help but laugh along. So here I was in the middle of the Loyal Sock Creek at midnight, under a full moon, laughing <laughs> at the sheer joy of being in God's presence. I connected with God that night and that summer in a way that that really changed my relationship with God and changed my, my life. It's no wonder to me then the power, the powerful metaphor that water can be for us. The beautiful liturgy in our hymnal of baptism as 
the, the story winds its way about how God has used water through creation uh, all the way up through freedom. And then it says these words, in the fullness of time, God sent Jesus. And even as I'm saying them, in the midst of that baptism, I, I have to watch that my words don't catch in my throat when I get to this phrase, Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. How intimate, how close God has come to us through this gift of water. Today, as we gathered in our opening worship, we celebrated the gathering together of water. We are named after the mighty Susquehanna River now as we uh, celebrate. Um, if we went back in reverse order up the Susquehanna River, we would hit the tributaries, the, the North Branch and the West Branch, the Swatera and the Juniata, the Lackawanna and the Loyal Sock, past our towns and our homes and our churches and our ministries. We gather as representatives from all these places using water as a metaphor for our connection to God and to one another. We celebrate our gathering as we celebrate water, collected, protected, consumed, except for tonight. Tonight we celebrate water poured out, released, never to be recollected, never to be reused. Paul writes to the Philippians, even now I am being poured out like a drink offering. He's referring to that Jewish practice of a daily offering of meat and grain and a quart of wine poured out over the sacrifice, never to be recollected, never to be reused, poured out, wasted. I even grew up in a church that had an active WCTU unit, and I would say that a quart of wine a, a day is wasted. <laughs> Twice, Paul uses this phrase, I am being poured out like a drink offering, and both times he finds himself imprisoned. It must have been rotten to have a personality like Paul and find yourself in prison, stuck there, unable to reach out, unable to, to do anything, unable to get out and to teach and to preach and to travel. And Paul knows his time is winding down, never to be recollected, never to be reused, poured out, wasted. We object to wasted time, don't we? We're good at wasting things. But when it comes to wasting time, it's very difficult for us. I was walking around campus last night and I made the mistake of answering someone that I thought was addressing me when in reality they were talking on their phone that I couldn't see. You've done that, right? You've done that. Well, you know, walking around campus and it was not a saunter, it was a purposeful walk with the pedometer. They were getting their steps in. We multitask well, we don't want to waste our time. Imagine what it would be like for us traveling with Jesus. Jesus wasted time everywhere he went. The unnecessary pouring out of resources of time into unprofitable and unpredictable people. Time never to be recollected, never to be recovered, wasted. Don't you know that that pint of nard could have been sold and given to the poor. If you were a prophet, you would know that you are wasting time eating with these tax collectors and whores. If you had only been here and not wasting time with your disciples in some jerk water town, my brother would not have died. 
Jesus modeled a life poured out, beautifully wasted on those who needed to hear, who sought to know, who clamored to see. He poured himself into people and places where time needed to be spent, never to be recollected, never to be recaptured, but never, ever wasted. Paul knew Jesus. On that road to Damascus, Paul encountered a God who released his life, poured out to be used in whatever way God would see fit. It is in this pouring out that Paul makes the connection with the church in Philippi. He likens his pouring out of life like wine poured on that sacrifice. The Philippians' sacrifice of love and service to God so that in that letter he talks about how their sacrifices mingle together, enhancing one another. Paul says, I am glad. I am glad and I rejoice with all of you, so you should be glad and rejoice with me. Even in his suffering, Paul rejoices. For he sees these mutual gifts touch one another and mingle together as they advance the kingdom of God. And yet to truly pour ourselves out, to release the hold that we have, the control that we take on our lives, we have to let go. We have to be open to God's direction. We must respond to the invitation to pour out our lives. And what would that look like if we really did that? Last November, I had the opportunity to travel out to Columbus, Ohio to visit the Church for All People, built intentionally on the dividing line between the uh, Caucasian community and the African, African American community. There at the Church for All People, we encountered so many uh, different services that went on, but the, the one that touched my heart was an evening of uh, an open mic where people just got up and sang and shared their talents. You've never seen a church that had more diversity uh, culturally, uh, racially, economically. And I met Heath. It was hard to miss Heath. He was built like a defensive lineman. And he walked in and he just engulfed people with his embrace. Heath was uh, uh, a man who we would say was on the margins of society. And yet in the years that he had been involved with the church with all people, he had uh, got on the board of trustees and took his job very, very seriously. But he, for all his size, was one who was not afraid to be open to God's spirit. That night that we were listening to the open mic, I happened to be sitting next to Heath, and there was a particularly touching song. And Heath just broke down in tears, weeping, weeping next to me, this mammoth of a man. And I, I kind of put my hand on his shoulder and tried to comfort him a little bit. Across the room comes this about eight-year-old boy and he makes a beeline for Heath, and he, he stands in front of him, and even standing in front of him, Heath was sitting, this boy was standing. He still had to reach up to put his arms around Heath's big old neck, and he gave him a hug. Now, this little boy was white, brown hair. Heath, very large, African-American. This little boy stepped back and he looked at me and with his hand still on Heath's shoulder, he pointed to Heath and he said, this is my brother. This is my brother. I, I can't make this up. I, I was stunned. I said, it, it, 
have I ever been in a place that I have witnessed the kingdom of God more than in this moment? These two, in their mutual sacrifice to one another, mingle together in that moment and proclaim for me the kingdom of God in a way that I will never forget. These names, these names that are before you this evening, these names that we lift up in memory, they feel so close tonight. As if they are just on the, the other side of that veil in heaven. And they would say to us, hey, we struggled too. We know. But what do we remember about these people? We would say to them, we remember your pouring out. We remember your opening yourselves up to God and to us. We remember those moments of complete release when we witness God's work in your life. When I think of people on this list, I think of Charlie Klinger's laugh. I think of Bob Harala's stories. I think of Donna Cottle's wit. Where you are, where you're seated, what do you remember about the names that are before you? These gifts, unmeasured, poured out, never pe to be recollected, never to be recaptured. What a beautiful waste. What a beautiful waste of time as their lives were poured out and today mingle with our own sacrifices of love and service. It is a risk to open ourselves up to God in this way, to arise every morning and instead of first looking at our calendar, to look within and to look to God and to say, I wonder what God will do with me today. This morning, this meeting, this trip to the store, this time at my desk, this moment with a friend. It is a risk to loosen our grip, to open ourselves, to pour out our very lives into the presence of God, for indeed it will be time that we will never get back. It will be unmeasured and unbridled. But thanks be to God, we will find joy. Amen. Oh,